One of the great privileges of starting a church is meeting like-minded believers. And oftentimes, rightly or wrongly, we think that most of them live around us. And one of the great joys that we've had is getting to know believers from different parts of the country, and in this case, different parts of the world. Um, Andrew taught, Andrew Curry and his wife, Sarah, and their three children were here last week. As you know, he is the senior pastor at Emmanuel Baptist Church in Lisburn, Northern Ireland, right outside of uh, Belfast. And we have known Andrew for several years now. It has been a great blessing. One thing that you may not know, uh, his church is in some ways similar to ours. They have three elders. When Andrew took over the church, there had not been elders at the church for multiple years. So the Lord is using Andrew uh, in Northern Ireland. Um, he teaches often there, and it's just been such a privilege. He gives us wise counsel. He prays for our church. Um, so it, it, it's become a wonderful friendship, and uh, he's one of my uh, favorite people. So Andrew, would you please come forward and read the scriptures and pray for us? Good morning. It's lovely to be back with you. It hasn't been very long, but it's good to be back. Uh, this week, I have been out in uh, Los Angeles, and uh, I was having lunch the other day with uh, Austin Duncan and with Dr. Stephen J. Lawson. And uh, the subject of our conversation wasn't intended to be, but it turned to Trinity. And we were just talking about what an encouraging thing it has been to watch the story of Trinity Bible unfold, and just what a sense of privilege and joy each of us has when we get to come and we get to share God's word with you. So please do know, uh, I know you know uh, uh, Stephen J. Lawson very well, but please know that each of the men who come and speak, we just count it a real privilege to have fellowship with you. Now, if you could open your Bibles, please, to Genesis chapter 2. Genesis chapter 2, we come to a wonderful passage this morning. I want to read it to you. Hopefully that gives you time to tune in to the different sound at the front. And then I want to pray and ask God for help before we begin. Uh, Genesis chapter 2, let me read from verse 18. Then the Lord God said... It is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him a helper fit for him. Now out of the ground the Lord God had formed every beast of the field and every bird of the heavens and brought them to the man to see what he would call them. Whatever the man called every living creature, that was its name. The man gave names to all livestock and to the birds of the heavens and to every beast of the field, but for Adam there was not found a helper fit for him. So the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man. And while he slept, took one of his ribs and closed up its place with flesh. And the rib that the Lord God had taken from the man, he made into a woman and brought her to the man. Then the man said, This at last is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Therefore a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife and they shall become one flesh. And the man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we are so thankful for every portion of your revelation, but we recognize this morning we come to one of those foundational elements that are central to our society, one that we know well, the, the establishment of marriage and the establishment of the family unit and so, Lord, we pray that you would protect us from that sense of feeling that we already know 
what is meant to be said today. And we ask, Lord, that you would give us listening ears and open hearts to hear your word and to be conformed to it. We pray and ask, Lord, that you would help us to treasure this gift of marriage, to see it as something that you have given for the good of man, even before uh, the fall took place. We pray and ask, Lord, that you would encourage us within our marriages to act in ways that are uh, honorable to you. And we pray, Lord, even for those who uh, aren't yet married, we pray, Lord, that you would encourage them by seeing even in this wonderful picture of marriage something about your care for mankind, but also, Lord, that uh, reflection of the mystical union between Christ and his church. And we pray ultimately, Lord, that our study of your word would instruct us and prepare our hearts for that moment where we will eat the bread and drink the cup at the end of our service and remember the supreme cost by which our marriage to the Lamb took place. Lord, we pray that you would cause our hearts to worship you this morning in spirit and in truth, for we come pleading In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. We are gathered here in the presence of God before this congregation to join this man and this woman together in marriage. Marriage is a special relationship instituted by God and commended in Scripture as honorable to all who enter it lawfully and in true affection. It was confirmed as God's pattern for mankind in the teaching of the Lord Jesus and by his presence at the marriage feast in Cana. The Apostle Paul sets it forth as a picture of the mystical union between Christ and his church. Therefore, it ought not to be entered upon lightly or unadvisedly, but thoughtfully and reverently, considering the reasons for which it was ordained, And there are four such reasons. Firstly, it was ordained for the hallowing of the union between the man and the woman so that the natural instincts and affections being directed aright, they should live in purity and honor. Secondly, it was ordained for the increase of mankind and that children may be brought up in the fear and nurture of the Lord. Thirdly, it was ordained for the companionship, help, and comfort which husband and wife ought to have for each other. And lastly, it was ordained for the welfare of human society, which can be strong and happy only where the marriage bond is held in honor. It is into this holy estate that the couple come now to be joined. Therefore, if anyone can show any just cause why they may not lawfully be joined together in marriage, let them now declare it or else forever hold their peace. Now, I would at least like somebody to object and point out that there isn't a couple at the front. That's kind of foundational for this ceremony. You know those types of words. You remember those types of signs, whether it be marriages that you have attended and you've seen people who you care about and you're invested in committing themselves to one another, or whether it be maybe your own marriage. And as you, every time you hear that, those types of words, those uh, reminders that so often uh, prelude the the, the, the vows that a couple make one to another, you remember the significance and the weight and the importance of what is declared on that day. And what we come to today is something that occurs before Genesis chapter 3. You're going to find out next week about the fall. You're going to find out next week about how sin entered the world. But before sin came into the world, God gave a wonderful gift. And it was the gift of marriage. And it's that that this particular section of Genesis focuses on. We we talked last week about not only did God make the, the man and design him with wonderful intimacy, but in God's goodness, He gave an abundance of good things to the man. 
He gave him a place, a special garden to dwell within. He gave him, remember, good things to see that please the eye and yummy things to eat that please the tongue. He gave this uh, elaborate uh, irrigation system for the garden, those four major rivers. He gave him a work to do, to do a, a way of responding to God. He gave him the tree of life there in the center of the garden, a means by which life would be sustained. And he even gave his law to protect him. And what a good thing the law of God is. But he saves the best to last. And after this catalog of good things that he gives to Adam, he comes in and he crafts for Adam his most precious of gifts, his partner, Eve. And here before the fall, God sees fit, sees necessary, sees it as good for the marriage union to be established, the, the place where a family unit can grow and can flourish. And so we approach this story this morning, this true testimony of God. And sometimes we can approach this type of text with a hesitancy. Uh, we come to this amazing description with reservation partly because maybe some people in this room today come from broken homes. And you've seen bad pictures and reflections of marriage. Maybe you're all too aware of your own ugliness within your relationships. Maybe you're being currently hurt in the relationship that you're in or the lack of relationship. Maybe you long for marriage and you find any time it's mentioned in church a painful thing because it's something you long particularly for. And we all know, if we're being honest, that every marriage has its difficulties. But again, this is Genesis 2. And next week in Genesis 3, we'll, we'll, we'll find explanation for that brokenness. But before you get there, I want us to sit in Genesis 2 and to try and come to the text with an openness of mind, to try and come to the text recognizing that there is explanation for the difficulties and the hardships that many face in their marriage. And I want you to know that whatever background it is that you're coming from, that God has given this picture, this, this uh, pattern of marriage as a good thing. And in part, it is a good thing because it reflects something about the relationship that Christ has for his church. And so I'm so glad that this morning we will finish by eating the bread and drinking the cup, remembering the Lord in the way he is appointed for the Bible reveals Paul writes to the Ephesians and he tells them that in this pattern of marriage where the husband is to love his wife and the wife is to submit to her husband, there is a picture of the mystical union between Christ and his church. And, and, and that is uh, far better, far uh, uh, more wonderful than, than even the best of human marriages that we have experienced or witnessed. First thing I want us to notice this morning from the text is simply the plan of God. The plan of God. Look at verse 18 in the text. Verse 18. Then the Lord God said, it is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him a helper fit for him. This verse is all about God's design in the first marriage. And the first thing I want you to notice in that is the need for this marriage. The need for this marriage. And the text makes clear the reason there is a need for this marriage is the difficulty of being alone. God said it is not good that the man should be alone. And that is an, an amazing statement to come before the fall. Because God has made everything to this point. And God is the perfect designer. And, and he's made uh, much that he has declared is good. But it's not perfect. It's not final. There's something missing until this particular piece is added. 
something in his designed world at this point is not good, according to the text. Now, we need to think about what uh, the, the, the text is declaring when it says that something is good or not good. Back in chapter 1, six times between verses 3 and verse 25, you have revelation that something was good. In uh, chapter 1, verse 4, God declares the light good. In day 3, chapter 1, verse 10, God declares the provision of the land good. In verse 12, the provision of vegetables, good. Uh, for uh, day four, chapter one, verse 18, the provision of the sun and the moon to mark time is a good thing. In day five, chapter one, verse 21, the provision of birds and fish is good. And in day six, chapter one, verse 25, the provision of the animals is also called good. In fact, only in day two, where there's the uh, separation of the water and sky, does God not pronounce it good? It's just silence at that particular point. And, and, and there's a, a wait until the next day when the land is formed. And then, twice on that day, declaration is made that that is good. Now, why is that? Why is there that distinction on day two? And that hesitation to call the sky and the water good until land is formed. Well, I think that it's because the good that is being referred to is good for mankind. God's centerpiece in his creation is the man and the woman that he is designing. And the good that he declares about these things is it is good for them. It is right for them. The delight is good for them. Uh, uh, not, not sea and uh, sky, uh, it's not good until land is formed because there they can plant their feet. The, the, the birds, the fish, the animals, they are good for mankind. And the vegetables, you know, even if you begrudge it, are good for you. The good that's being talked about here is the good that, it, that this created world brings to the people that God places within it. Now, why is that important? Well, it's important because here we come to verse 18, and we're told that something is not good. It is not good. God has designed this world and made it, and he says in verse 18 that there is something not good right. That the, the man that is in the garden, it is uh, not for his benefit to be left in this particular state. He's missing something, something that's needed for his flourishing, for his success in this world, is absent at this moment. So what is the text saying? Well, it very clearly is saying Eve is missing, and Eve needs to be made here now, now, we know that uh, the Bible isn't saying that it is sinful to be alone. For in other places, the Bible talks about the, 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 the specialness of uh, singleness for certain individuals. In fact, the Bible makes clear that there can be people who are called to a pattern of singleness. Some of the greatest elders and some of the greatest deacons that the church have been served by in the past are men who were called to a, a life of singleness. They were able to serve God all the more effectively. 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 8 says, to the unmarried and the widows, I say, it is good for them to remain single as I am. Indeed, the Lord Jesus Christ, one who is without sin, was a single man. So, so the Bible isn't saying here that it is sinful for Adam to be alone. There is no sin in the world at this point. But what, he, what the Bible is saying is that it can be hard to be alone. It can be difficult to be alone. That there is an added hardship that loneliness can bring to the individual living in this world. We were made to be part of a community. And we know that to be true. Life is hard. 
And often it is harder when you are alone. There are times when you need someone to hold your hand. There's times when you need somebody to cry with. There's times you need someone to draw alongside and encourage you. Uh, It's times you need somebody to pray with you. Times you just need somebody to be there with you. And thankfully, many who are single or widowed can speak of having known how God has provided it for them and supported them through loving parents, through caring siblings, through committed friends, and often very significantly through the church family. Yet even this blessing of help from friends and family, even with that, at times the individual can often feel isolated and often feel alone. These moments can be hard and can be difficult. It is not good in that sense that the man should be alone. The need for marriage, it is difficult to be alone. But I also want you to notice the purpose in marriage, the purpose in this particular marriage. In verse 18, God meets Adam's need in a remarkable way, and a pattern is laid down here. It says, then the Lord God said, it is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him a helper fit for him. This is not a verse that commands or guarantees marriage, but it is a verse that gives us a window into understanding something about God's intention in marriage. When he does allow this gift to be given to you in your life, we get an insight into the blessing that it can bring. You see three purposes highlighted in verse 18, and the first one is that of companionship. There's a wonderful blessing of companionship that is found in marriage. This is maybe the most obvious thing, especially given what we just said. If God's creation of marriage is a response to his declaration, it is not good that the man should be alone, then obviously what is happening in marriage in part is that it is a place for companionship, for for togetherness. For those who, of you who have been married, one of the biggest blessings that came from that moment you got married was that you are not alone anymore, that you have somebody with you till death you do part. You have somebody with you. And yet it's so easy, isn't it, to take this blessing of companionship for granted and to miss out on all of the richness that, it, that, that, that companionship and marriage can afford. When we do premarital in the church, often we, we, we have these younger couples and we spend time trying to encourage them that, to make time in their marriage for each other. It can disappear so quickly. And and you need to be purposeful, having evening meals together, uh, making time where there's some evenings in the week where you are actually both at home at the same time, Uh, turning off your phone when you're on holiday so that you can enjoy the treasure, the blessing of those moments that you get together. Because God has provided marriage as a place for companionship. And, And so in healthy marriages, There is togetherness. We need to be purposeful in in valuing and enjoying that particular blessing. The second blessing that we find in marriage is help. There is help. Verse 18 continues. Then the Lord God said, it is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him a helper, a helper. And we have a tendency in 2021 to to look at this particular term, helper, and to read it as some sort of patronizing statement. But that says more about you than it says about the biblical text. But this is a powerful word. This is a beautiful word. This is a word that most often in Scripture is used to describe the action of God on behalf of his people. Exodus chapter 18, verse 4 The God of my father was my help and delivered me from the sword of Pharaoh, 
1 Samuel chapter 7, verse 12. Then Samuel took a stone and set it up between Mizpah and Sheen and called its name Ebenezer. For he said, till now the Lord has helped us. Or one of the most well-known verses in Scripture, Psalm 46, verse 1. God is our refuge and strength and very present help in trouble. And in other words, what I want you to see is this word helper is not a soft word. It's a mighty word. It's a God word. It's a strong word. And it speaks of not the weakness in the individual doing the helping by no means. What it speaks of is the need in the recipient. They need help. They need support. This word helper simply speaks of one who supplies strength in the area that we feel weak. And, that, and here in marriage, this is the blessing that we find. Every single person in this room, I don't know you all personally, but every single person in this room lacks in some way. There's weaknesses that we have. None of us have it all together. None of us are perfect in ourselves. And, and, and nor should we be. That's not the way God designed us. We need help. Sometimes, again, when we get the privilege in church of marrying a young couple especially, when they come up to the front, the, the bride has the biggest eyes in the world. And she's only looking at one person, her husband. And in that moment, she's under the illusion <laughs> that he is perfect. He has no faults. There's nobody quite like him. But eventually, <laughs> she comes to realize the painful truth that her husband does make mistakes, that occasionally he gets frustrated. And he himself is only far too aware of his own weaknesses. But that's what makes marriage such an amazing gift. He's not perfect, and he needs help. And, and that's how God designed marriage to function. No, no, not where two perfect individuals try and impress each other all the time, but where two individuals help one another, where, where, where two individuals make up for each other's weaknesses. They shoulder the load. This is the idea. You have a man here with a helper making up where he feels lacking. You have a lady here who gets a helper, who supplies strength where she feels weak. My marriage is a synergistic relationship. With the support of God, we're able to find in one another support and help that allows us not just to do our individual tasks, but where everything gets multiplied. Where everything is, is, is made to blossom more because of the help that we find in one another. And that's why it's part of God's wonderful design. Here in marriage, you find the blessing of companionship. You find the blessing of help. And you find the blessing of a compliment. A compliment. Listen to how verse 18 finishes. Then the Lord God said, It is not good that the man should be alone. I will make a helper fit for him, fit for him. Or we could say corresponding to him. Those last three words aren't saying that they are the same. In fact, they're saying the opposite, that there's a complement. There's a difference that complements in these two individuals. Adam was not good by himself. And God's solution to that is not um, another mirror image of Adam. I'll make Adam 2.0 and that'll make everything go better. No, God knows that what Adam needs is not Adam. Rather, what Adam needs is one crafted by God, designed 
with thought and care to correspond to him, to fit for him. Oh, what Adam needs is not a clone, but a compliment. <laughs> Have you ever met, or maybe you've been in a restaurant and you see one of those married couples where they, they look so alike, you know? <laughs> they, they, they could be brother and sister. There's something very creepy about it, isn't it? <laughs> That's not the way it's meant to be. Because in God's design, the husband and the wife, they are different. By design, they are different. They, they, they're meant to see things differently. They're, they're meant to automatically respond to things differently. They have different strengths and different weaknesses and in the eyes of God, that's not a wrong thing. That's a good thing. That's the design of marriage. In marriage, we find a compliment in each other. Now, it needs to be informed and guided by Scripture and infused with prayer. But we are meant to be different and to work through things. That's the blessing of marriage. You have this need for marriage, the difficulty of being alone, and then you have the purpose revealed in marriage, that here in marriage we find companionship, we find help, and we find a compliment. Now I want you just to notice the method of God. How does he bring it all to be? Well, the first thing God does is he makes Adam aware of his need. Look at verse 19. Now out of the ground the Lord God had formed every beast of the field and every bird of the heaven and brought them to the man to see what he would call them. And whatever the man called every living creature, that was its name. The man gave names to all livestock and to the birds of the heavens and to every beast of the field. But for Adam, there was not found a helper fit for him. Now, sometimes it takes guys, especially, a long time to twig on especially to the blessing of marriage. And so what God does to help this man is he gives him a huge job to do. Name all the animals. And the animal parade begins and every single creature comes before Adam and he, he looks with the most amazing of minds. God, this is unfallen human mind unfallen human intellect and he takes each animal and he studies it and he notices its, its, its habits and the way it operates and all the types of quirks to that particular animal and he picks a name appropriate to it. A suitable name is selected. Now, when we were uh, expecting our first child, Isla, we spent the guts of nine months wrestling with what we would call this child. And even at the end, it was a, with hesitation that we settled on the name Isla. Imagine Adam time after time after time after time naming all the animals with such precision. This took creativity. This took thought. This took understanding. And it demonstrated his authority over all the creatures. It functioned at that level. But it was also for Adam a revealing work. Not only did he learn about all these creatures, but it, with every single one of them, it was observed that the, the stallion had a mare, that the rooster had a hen. The lion had a lioness. And in all of the study, there's a click that takes place in his mind. So, it's so interesting how many of them have someone corresponding to them. And yet for Adam, he does not have that. Sometimes young men are the same. You know, they get very comfortable in life. They're busy with their work or their study. And then one day, they wake up and realize I have no one corresponding to me. It'd be nice to have a partner. 
And, and, and that's what's happening with Adam here. God makes him aware of his need for this wonderful provision. And then God crafts the woman. Look at verse 21. So the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man. And while he slept, took one of his ribs and closed up its place with flesh. And the rib that the Lord God had taken from the man, he made into a woman and brought her to the man. Verse 21 stresses that God caused, God did. God is the action in this whole story. It's all his doing. That's a stress in verse 21. And also verse 21 makes clear that in God's design, the, the woman is made from the man. She is literally bone of my bone, Adam can say. It stresses just how closely tied the man and the woman are. They come from one body and they will become one flesh. And even in that picture of the selection of the rib as the, 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 the point from which Eve is made it is a beautiful picture of the nature of what their relationship will be. Matthew Henry, he famously said, the woman was made out of a rib of the side of Adam, not out of his head to be ruled over by him or off his feet to be trampled upon by him, but out of his side to be equal with him, under his arm to be protected and near his heart to be his beloved. Isn't that a wonderful picture of the nature of the relationship between the husband and the wife? Notice also the, the craftsmanship of God in making this woman. We, we uh, see there in that word in, uh, in verse 8 how, how God had already designed and crafted the man, and now he does the same of the woman. The, the, the word is one that would be used in the field of architecture. This, this is thoughtful, this is planned, this is precise, this is carefully crafted in correspondence to the environment and the need and the demand. Here God makes his statement peace. He crafts it with his own hand and it's this wonderful woman for the man. And then God in verse 22 brings the woman to the man. Look at the end of verse 22. He brought her to the man. God had already brought all the animals to Adam and helped Adam learn about his need, but now he brings a solution. Uh, now he brings to the man the one that he longed for. Now, it may be an overstretch of the text, but it's very hard given the nature of what's being unfolded here for us not to um, picture in verse 22 the idea of the father giving away his daughter and the idea of God here bringing the one that he has carefully made and shaped and presenting him to this man in order that this man will be able to look after and to care for this wonderful daughter created by God. God, in a sense, walks her down the aisle to give her to the man. It reminds us, doesn't it, of just what a, a, an important thing takes place in marriage where a father gives the daughter away and the husband must remember that he has received a man's daughter but also received a child of God. You know, the, the, there's a duty of care built into this picture. Look at the reaction of Adam. Verse 23. Then the man said, this at last is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she has been taken out of man. Now, I want you to look at your text in front of you. Look at your Bible. Do, do you notice how the text looks different in, in, in your Bible? Maybe it's indented a little bit differently. The structure is a little bit more broken up. One line doesn't run into the next. That's because what you have here in the Hebrew text is poetry. This is a song. We, 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 we've broken into song here. And in other words, Eve walks up 
and is presented to Adam and <gasps> he bursts into this jubilant song as he gazes at her. He's seen all the animals. He liked them, he studied them, he named them, but he didn't sing. <laughs> but he sings when he sees Eve. And in fact, this is the first recorded word of any man in all Scripture. Adam has talked, obviously, he named the animals, but we never, it was never necessary to record that in Scripture. But this gets recorded because this is a special moment. Just as God sang over all creation in chapter 1, verse 27, and deemed the man and the woman particularly special, so now Adam sings over the woman that God has brought to him to meet in verse 23. And there's been a lot of love songs written ever since. I want you as well then to see the pattern of God. The pattern of God. Look at verse 24. Therefore a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife and they shall become one flesh. And the man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed. Here we have the establishment of the family unit. No longer is there an individual here. Now we have one flesh. Now we have a team. So they, they are so intertwined. It's as if, even though they are separate individuals, they work as one. I have a non-Christian friend who I had the privilege of doing his marriage. And in his marriage speech, he talked about how excited he was they were getting married because each of them, they would be able to help each other excel in their own things, excel in their own lives. And he doesn't get marriage because marriage is that coming together where we work together to drive the team forward. It's about us now. You also see in verse 25 this idea that there, there's so much trust. That there, there, there's a safeness in marriage. No body images and uh, no body image issues in this particular marriage. Or rather, we're told that they were naked. Nakedness in Scripture it always speaks of a vulnerability. There's a vulnerability that comes with nakedness. And, uh, and the idea of it makes us squirm. And yet that's not what's seen here. Later, the man and the woman will feel shame over their nakedness. But they don't hear. Why is that? Well, in a significant way, it's the quality of the trust that they have for each other. It's very rare to find that type of trust and safeness even in marriage. Normally, at most marriages, between the, the man and the woman, there's some level still of insecurity below the surface. They still all the time are wondering, does he really like me? Is she really committed? Have I changed? Has that changed the tone of the relationship? But here, these two, they're completely exposed and yet happy in it, content in it, because there's complete trust in this relationship. That's how God designed it to be, a, a, a trust, a, an ability to know that each other is there for each other, and no matter what comes. This, this is a wonderful design. This is beautiful. This is safe togetherness that is built on trust, and it's something we should all be striving for in our marriages but there's more in this picture that the rest of Scripture unfolds. This is one of the most wonderful pictures that God has built into the very fabric of, of society around this whole globe. But the New Testament makes clear that marriage is a picture, as we've said before, of the mystical union between Christ and his church. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 32 spells that out specifically. There in Ephesians chapter 5, 
Uh, Paul unfolds the dynamics of the home, the call for the man to love his wife, as Christ loved the church, the call for the wife to submit to her husband. And then he goes on talking about what that means and what that looks like. And then he spells out in verse 32 that he is talking about the way we are, are, are linked to the picture of Christ and his church. In marriage, in this design of marriage are echoes and hints as to the nature of how Christ relates to his people. The, the, the believer has found in Christ the very best. Uh, the believer has found in Christ not one who loves like the best of human husbands, but he has found the absolute best. There is no relationship like this relationship. There's no commitment stronger than what we find here. Oh, the Christian knows that they are never truly alone, for he is always with them. The Christian knows that they are loved. In fact, they love him because he first loved them. Well, when the Christian listens to the design of Genesis chapter 2 and hears about the, the gift, of a companion that God provides in marriage. Their understanding of what that means is shaped by the, the fact that they have trusted Christ and in him found that friend who sticks closer than a brother, the true companion. When the Christian hears about the blessing of a helper, one who supplies strength when they feel weak. That definition is defined by the fact that we have a, the Holy Spirit indwelling us who every day is helping us. Jesus said, it is good that I go that the helper may come. When the Christian hears that in God's design of marriage, they find a compliment in their marriage partner. They are reminded about how we found in Christ the perfect complement that we needed as sinful creatures. We found in him one without sin who became sin for us. I know, as I said at the beginning of the service, that each person here has a very different experience of marriage. And that so often can can stunt us from embracing the, the fullness of this wonderful picture. But let me remind you, your broken home, if that's what you come from, is not the story that defines this marriage between Christ and the church. In fact, your earthly marriage, if it is a wonderful thing, and I hope and pray it is, even that is not the divining story of how Christ loved the church. Always, the story of Christ and his unsurpassing love is something greater and bigger. It's, it's the, the great story by which all of world history unfolds. Christ saved and cared for his bride. We come before him exposed in our naked sin, and yet we could come before him and feel no shame. Because as we said before, he became sin for us. We collectively are his bride, the Bible says, being prepared for that marriage feast. Just as Eve was handcrafted by God, our sin is being purged as we move through this process of sanctification. Our love for God, Philippians chapter 1, verse 9, is abounding more and more uh, through his work in us. We are being made more beautiful in our character, in our behavior, in our desires. We are beginning to produce and more and more produce the fruit of righteousness, and it's God's way of handcrafting us, just as he did for Eve, to prepare us, the church, to be the bride of Christ. It's amazing we live in a world that proclaims that all at once is love. People want love. 
and say they want to be loved. But there is no love like the love that we find in Christ. This is what defines everything else. And what I want you to recognize this morning is that there is nothing, no relationship like the one we enjoy with Jesus Christ. Treasure your marriage if you have a marriage. If you're single and you long for it, pray that God will bring you a partner that you can love and care for because it is a wonderful goodness of God that he has given this gift to our world. But there is no relationship like the relationship with Christ and his church. Even marriage itself is designed to be a a reflection, a, a, a signpost that points to that even more profound relationship, that even more profound love that we find in our connection to Jesus Christ. Have you come to know him this morning as yours? Have you embraced the Savior as your loved one this morning? Christian, will you have your Savior to be your wedded husband, to live together according to God's law in the holiest state of marriage? Will you love him, comfort him, honor and keep him in all things and keep only on to him as long as you shall live? Are you committed to Christ this morning? That's the ultimate thing that is all important, the ultimate relationship that matters. Let me pray. Heavenly Father, we do thank you for the wonderful grace and goodness of marriage. We thank you, Lord, that you have provided this this institution that is necessary for the flourishing of society. We thank you, Lord, that you have given this grace to so many, even here, that you have allowed them the blessing of the, the companionship and the help and the compliment that one finds in another. Lord, we do pray for those who are in the church and are widowed or single, and we pray, Lord, that you would uh, draw alongside them help and support and the blessing of community, that they would Uh, be protected from that feeling of loneliness uh, by knowing the love and the care of so many around them. And if it is your will, we pray, Lord, that you would bring into their life one who can help them and partner with them also. For those who are married, Lord, we pray that you would help them to treasure that relationship that you have gifted to them. We pray, Lord, that you would help them to truly help each other We ask, Lord, that you would give them the desire to be together and to to know and to uh, work through life with one another. And we pray they would know the blessing that comes through that. But Lord, we also thank you most for our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. And we thank you in the perfect design of marriage, how it points to an even greater relationship that relationship of Christ to his church. And so, Lord, we pray that even uh, now as we come to eat the bread and drink the cup, that you would remind us and prepare us in our thoughts and that you would stir up within us that love and that affection for Jesus Christ and that even in our eating and drinking that we would worship him. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.